welcome to NDTV Dialogues, a conversation of ideas. On Dialogues this week, we discuss the landmark socio-economic and caste census of rural India, which has found, among other things, nearly 75% of rural India, that's nearly 18 crore households, the income of the highest earning member is less than 5,000 rupees. That's the stark reality that faces India today. Is it time for a radical shift in how India deals with poverty? Joining me for more on that, the Rural Deve Development Minister Chaudhary Barendra Singh joins me for a short interview. I'm also joined by a larger panel of many different voices. I'm joined by Yogendra Yadav, also Surjit Bhalla, Manvendra Singh, BGP MLA, Dushant Chautala, also with me, uh, Chabi Rajavat, Sarpanch of Soda Village in Rajasthan. Chaudhary Barendra Singh Ji, thank you very much uh, for joining the dialogues. What for you, sir, is the big lesson from this survey? What is the plan the government uh, will now look at to tackle these startling and very depressing figures? You, uh, I'm not uh, talking of the figures, but uh, the way this uh, survey was conducted for social, economic and caste survey, uh, I think this has been the most transparent and most authentic survey. Uh, they have calculated that there are about uh, 25 crore households in our country mm -hmm. and out of those, uh, when the survey was completed, 96 lakh households uh, raised certain objections uh, about the survey which was conducted. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, it's very heartening to know that 97% of the objections were cleared. So what I mean is the, 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 the guidelines or the parameters fixed by uh, to conduct this uh, type of survey, uh, in my opinion, it, it has been the best survey uh, in the last 40, 50 years. So you're saying the methodology, the data which has emerged is uh, accurate but does it does it mean that the government now has to completely relook at the way that the government fights poverty i mean more than 60 years after independence we still have such stark poverty in rural india does it show that welfare scheme subsidies schemes like manrega have failed you've been in the congress your entire political career till last year do you feel that the way we have dealt with tackling poverty so far has been wrong you defended Manrega, you said this government will back Manrega. Will that all now change or do you think it, it shows that we need Manrega or subsidy schemes even more? It's, you know, it's not only Manrega. There were so many flagship programs, so many centrally sponsored schemes launched in the last 40 years. Uh, and uh, some of them, of course, yielded results. If I talk of PMGSY, Pradhan Mantri Gramin Sarak Yojana, uh, which was launched uh, in the time of when uh, uh, Vajpayee ji was the Prime Minister. Uh, in my own assessment, this has been one of the best uh, uh, flagship program. But uh, this time, the survey, if you see, I don't mean that uh, the last efforts of 40, 50 years were not the efforts uh, um, uh, without any uh, substance. Uh, that is not my meaning. What I want to say is, this time the survey was the inclusion and exclusion on the basis of certain parameters, on the basis of certain guidelines. Uh, some households were included, that is, uh, of course, and those uh, uh, houses which were not included by that survey, that, that, that the basis of inclusion and exclusion, that has been the main, uh, you know, benchmark of uh, the result of our uh, No, that, that's survey. a fair point, but I think the question will be what action will now be taken and why I use Manrega as an example, because Mr. Arun Jaitley, the finance minister, said after this that the best way to tackle poverty is to have growth at a healthy level. I think he said about above 8%. He said that's how poverty will be fought. That was a view uh, earlier uh, propounded by economists, but many said that growth model has failed India because... There were so many who were still poor despite uh, high levels of uh, growth at a certain time. Do you feel that the future lies in continuing schemes like Manrega? As I said, you backed Manrega, Nitin Gadkari ji, 
was uh, your predecessor was not he in fact wanted to restrict manrega which is the way forward this government is going to go that is what i say that in my uh, ministry uh, what we have decided that we would follow uh, the outcome of this survey and uh, uh, the uh, the parameters now for the flagship programs would be by and large um, according to the result of the survey of uh, socio economic and the caste survey and manrega is of course uh, manrega would also be judged in that light and uh, what i say is uh, manrega um, uh, is a uh, is a scheme or is a flagship program which has penetrated into deep into the village life and uh, to a great extent it has been a success story but still there are so many uh, hiccups so many loopholes uh, for which we are making our best efforts to see that those should be plugged and one thing which uh, which we have taken a decision is that now manrega uh, funds can be used up to 60% mm -hmm. for agriculture and allied agriculture services so right. when agriculture production and productivity would increase naturally uh, there would be more employment and more work for even for manrega workers and one uh, the important thing uh, which prime minister is making uh, about skill india which which he has declared uh, just two, two three days back yes we have decided to take out certain manrega workers those who want to come out of that rut every time every year they are to become um, and or the stamped as labor or manrega labor now we want to give them the training so that they can come out and they can also think of going ahead in the life uh, rather not to sticking to this uh, mm -hmm. uh, manrega thing and uh, so th the land bill of course also under your ministry we've seen that even the committee which is meeting on it has had various postponements it seems that there's an unofficial go slow on the land bill especially before the bihar elections it's unlikely it will come in this uh, session of parliament one another fact which has come up in the census is that over 51% of people in rural india are actually landless so when we focus so much on the land bill what provisions are we looking at for perhaps for disruptions in the lives of those who work on the land yet have no stake in it or who do not own it what about compensation have we ignored the problem of landless labor and first is it now confirmed that the land bill is actually on the back burner no chance of it before the bihar elections no no there is no such thing as uh, putting it at the back burner but uh, you know the matter is now rest with uh, a joint committee of parliament and uh, this has been informed that the uh, joint committee has asked for extension uh, otherwise the recommendation of the committee Uh, should have uh, with us uh, or with the parliament uh, uh, before the start of the session but now when they have asked for extension now it depends on the uh, on the uh, lok sabha speaker whether uh, what kind of extension and uh, for how much time it would be given right sir so, finally of course the elephant in the room it's a caste census but we still don't know when that caste data will be out i know professor panagriya is now in charge of it but do you think why release these figures without having released the caste data at the same time doesn't it actually compromise the understanding of this data if you release it without caste no is uh, actually if you see all the three things put together it is not possible uh, that uh, caste uh, you know data can be out mm -hmm. there is a mention that there were 44 lakh caste gotras and sub caste and all that so it may take some time uh, but uh, of course the um, uh, the caste uh, base uh, data may be out but uh, time is a factor chauthi brinder singh ji thank you very much for giving us uh, your valuable time and joining us in the dialogues thank you very much dr bhalla thank now you. on the niti ayog task force which I will be studying these figures very closely Did you agree with the minister there an old congressman now a BJP wala who pretty much backed Manrega I know Manrega is not one of your favorite projects because you might say that these figures show that it's time for a complete overhaul You know <coughs> looking at the census figures 
Um, I have three brief points that I want to make. First, that the survey was completed in 2011-12 mm -hmm. on the basis of handheld computers, so which is the modern way to do it. So my question is, does it take us four years to process this data? Um, so that's a big question mark on the data. Uh, before we go any further, I believe that there shouldn't be any information that should be kept from the public, so the cast data should be released. But it is a problem in the sense of all these casts, et cetera, but it should be released. But my third point is actually the most worrisome. I've looked at, and I can, we can go through it in detail, these data are really, really problematical. And I would not even sort of dream of deriving any conclusion from this data. Mm -hmm. They are that bad. Why do you think that? Oh, well, look at the land list. See, we have a benchmark. First of all, this was not done by the Registrar of Census, which has, I think, some credibility. This was done by the Ministry of Rural Development. We have lots of information for the last 67 years by the NSS. And the NSS does surveys every year, and then large sample surveys every five years. And I've compared, this was done in 2011-12, and I've compared, which I'll be publishing soon, the data that, that can be compared from the two surveys, whether it's education or it's income, et cetera, That's and it just is very problematic. Professor Yadav, come in on that because you, you weren't agreeing with a lot of what the minister said. Do you feel that it will perhaps be more about going on a different model rather than saying expand welfare schemes where some would argue that that's the message which comes out uh, though of course Dr. Palla says look don't trust this data will it now actually be more people saying that look this shows a welfare sub economy or perhaps the UPA policies haven't worked we need a radical break so there are two very different things here one is what does the survey reveal and two what policy implications follow from that you can have two very very different readings from the same set of data yes you know and uh, i'm sure professor balla and i will end up having two very different readings of the same data you should. but first is no no it's policy implications uh, what policy, policy? Yeah, yeah we can have very should, two implications. we shouldn't have different readings first is of the, the same data. quality of data and i tend to agree with some of the points that uh, professor balla made dr balla made uh, and i was actually very surprised by what the minister said uh, either he doesn't know what he's talking about he may have been briefed 10 minutes before the program to claim that this is the best survey in the <laughs> last 40 years. I mean, he probably doesn't know what kind of surveys take place in India. NSS is one of the finest statistical uh, information base in the world, not just in India. And we have the census of India, for heaven's sake, you know, which is actually much better than that. So I don't know why the minister had to make such ridiculous claims. Uh, the second thing is, I mean, it could well be simply a hangover of his Congress past. I mean, his government is not responsible. <laughs> Someone else was responsible. He could have easily said they botched it up. They, they, you know, this was silly. Uh, there are serious questions. There are some questions about uh, uh, the fact that it takes you three or four years to process something which you have done for the first time in such a smart, technical way. It should have come out in six months. Normally, census takes time, but this was different. Mm -hmm. um, two, unfortunately, the designing of the survey was such that it was not it was not meant to yield information which would either be strictly comparable to what we have or something which would hold 20 years from now so it was you know it was turned into a very peculiar policy information gathering exercise only 10% this is these are people who have 10000 or more income those who could possibly have a four wheel of there are only 2 or 3% with four wheelers mm -hmm. so it's and, and if you are looking at broad poverty, not the poverty line definitions technically written in a planning commission document, broadly two thirds of rural India lives in conditions which you and I would recognize to be conditions of abject poverty. Deprivation. And about one but, third of but, urban sorry. India as well, as we now learn I, from the newspaper the report this morning. I'm going to come back to the, same to the data the point, thing. but I actually want to bring yeah. in, as I said, three lawmakers at different levels from Sarpanch to MLA to MP and all from rural India to actually get there views on it. Uh, Chavi, I'm going to start with you because really as Sarpanch you see these uh, problems very much up close. When, we t when you see a new report come out or new data and conversations about now what kind of scheme should target it, do you think we miss the boat in planning? Do we get too obsessed with the numbers to uh, prove it? Because in this sense somebody who's above 10,000 is not necessarily extremely well off either. And What do you think we ignore when we look at this kind of data? I think we do tend to ignore a lot because um, 
uh, it's unfortunate, but the sad truth is that the hands and the fate of rural India lies in the hands of people who are far removed and very much disconnected from the grassroots reality. So while we may have these numbers, and as we've heard, it really should not come as a surprise because this is something for those who are working in the rural sector are aware that this is what the reality is. And um, but when politicians we, are from rural India, many of them, Chaudhary Brindar Singh himself is from rural India. So is that entirely true? When they become ministers, you think they get removed? Well, that's something you'll have to ask them. But I do feel that the voice of the rural is not heard. There are these policies which are made. They're, of course, I'm not saying they're not well-meaning schemes, but there's a huge disconnect. And I'll just share an example to put things in perspective. When I first got elected in 2010, I'd entered a government-declared droughthead zone. We needed safe drinking water, which wasn't available to us. We demanded for water-related projects. And in spite of that, the first project that was sanctioned for us was in Anganbadi, which was not the need of the hour. I finally had to turn to my family to provide funding to ensure that we're able to harvest rainwater to provide water to the, uh, to the villagers. So, and also in my own district, I'm taking my own example, I've seen that to provide basics to the urban area, rural sector has been deprived. My own district, the, uh, it's an arid zone, we are in Rajasthan, it's a desert state. People have known that we are hit by drought every now and then. In spite of that, the dam in our district pumped water to the urban sector, including Jaipur, Ajmer, etc. The pipeline was passing through the farms of the villages, but not a single drop was being given to them. To service that pipeline, the functional railway track was removed. As a result, the craftsmanship was lost because people no longer had a mode of transportation. So I'm sharing this in, as an example to show, show you the various layers at which the rural sector suffers because people are only looking at the urban sector, in addition to which when we call India a superpower, I would like to point out though, that while we're in the 21st century, it's interesting to note that usage of machinery is prohibited even today for rural development. Mm -hmm. Now, in a state like Rajasthan, where water is scarce, I think common sense would prevail that you provide desilting solutions. You allow for machinery to diesel the reservoir. Just by doing that, you'll be able to take care of 60% health issues as well as water-related issues. Perhaps that, I, I think that's a very important point. And interesting if you can come in, it's also the way we look at rural India. We somehow have a vision of some agrarian, not idyll, but some agrarian zone where the only agriculture solutions or they can dig bottomless wells, as uh, Vasundra Rajay has pointed out again when she, when she actually criticized Manrega quite strongly. Do you think now in our focus on smart cities, we're just not looking at smart villages enough, we're just not looking at, when we look at raising a certain level of uh, life, rural India and its issues are not actually in a holistic way integrated at all. You know, this is some, you know, village idyllic situation where you keep funding, you know, keep pumping in money, keep designing new schemes. You look at the number of schemes that have been made over the last decades, so many of them overlap each other. There is only one scheme which the minister alluded to. In my, you know, my experience in politics, there's only one scheme which is leak proof. And that is the Pradhan Mantri Gram Sadak Yojana. Every other scheme is leaking like a sieve. Because, you know, it is PMGSY is the only scheme which is data driven. So what's the way forward on that? You, you drive, you, you make, you simplify the schemes firstly. You decide what you need, what you don't need. Cut down the numbers of schemes, dovetail them, and then give, give, uh, have them data driven. You have both Professor Yadav, uh, Professor Yadav and Professor Bhalla have alluded to the fantastic surveys that have been done over the decades. Bring them together, use that as your database. Have your schemes data driven rather than being driven by politicians like me who decide who gets the benefits, who doesn't get the benefit. But that's what rural life is about. It's, it's parochial because people decide, politics decides who gets the benefits, who doesn't get the benefit. I'm going to bring in Dushyant Chautala, one of our youngest MPs elected this time. When you come in from a young perspective, uh, you come from, uh, when we talk about rural India, and uh, from a, your party is mainly focused on farmers. And we talk about farmers being used as vote banks. Now we're seeing uh, farmer suicides in Punjab, which is an area you've never seen it before. We talk about farmers in crisis, manual labor is an issue, which has never even come up. Uh, the Chaudhary Birendra Singh Ji talked about skilling manual labor now. Do you think, it, what is the new idea you would bring as a young MP? How do we actually look at making rural India at par or either bringing it up in some level with what we're seeing in urban India, the focus on smart cities. See, when we talk about farmers, I think uh, every session we talk about a agrarian crisis all over India, either it be in a tornado or heavy monsoon or a drought. 
and for the past year it was first maharashtra odisha and then it came to haryana rajasthan in the winters but are we talking really about farmers because when we talk about farmers not their crops is their families how they are dependent education how they get jobs and i think when uh, you see the rural urban movement you see a lot of farmers kids coming up to cities but because of lack of uh, lack of education at the ground level in the villages they cannot compete and the sons of farmers don't want to be farmers yes yeah. they want to come out they want to come to the city they want to get jobs that they can work for 10 to 12 hours and uh, go home safely so, and sleep so yes not just the children who don't want to become farmers the farmers don't want their children to become mm -hmm. farmers either and i think yeah. that's it's not a viable source of income any longer